The Simpsons is and likely always will be my favourite TV show. From watching it as a kid on BBC Two, on VHS, on Channel 4, and eventually collecting the DVD box sets. There was a time where I spent every night falling asleep to watching The Simpsons, mostly season 5 and 6. Because of this, it will always be a special show to me. I still have my old VHS tapes to this day. It's pretty cool seeing all this original artwork of The Simpsons just for a compilation of a few episodes. Outside of my love for the show, The Simpsons back in the 90s was massive and was one of the most popular TV shows at the time, averaging nearly 30 million viewers per episode in its first season in the US. With any successful franchise, they always cross over into other forms of entertainment, and that was no different for The Simpsons and video games. With the 90s being the peak of Simpsons popularity, and it being cheaper and easier to release games compared to today's AAA market, developers were not shy about putting out a lot of Simpsons games. Despite being a fan of The Simpsons, I was quite on and off with the video games growing up, which is most likely due to their inconsistent quality. I played some of the 2D era games, but didn't get much out of them outside of just being interested in how off and strange they felt. Can't say I remember enjoying them much as games though. During the 3D era, I had The Simpsons Road Rage for the GameCube, and of course put a lot of time into what many would call the best Simpsons game, The Simpsons Hit and Run. Outside of that, I did play through The Simpsons game, and wasted probably too much time on The Simpsons Tapped Out, but that's where this story ends. EA seemingly still owns the license to publish Simpsons games, but with the show not as popular as it once was, and licensed games also going out of fashion, there hasn't been any new Simpsons games since 2012, and no major releases since 2007. As someone who still watches the show regularly, and has played some of these games, it got me interested in going back and revisiting every single Simpsons game ever made. Certain games do have a bit of a bad reputation, honestly I would guess most of them do, but I want to go back and play them all myself and rank them. Find out what the worst Simpsons games are, and find out what is the best Simpsons game ever made. It might not be The Simpsons Hit Run. It could be Bart's House of Weirdness for all we know. You don't know, you've never played it. To make such a ranking, it only makes sense to start at the beginning with the very first Simpsons game ever released, so today I'll be checking out The Simpsons 4 Arcade. The Simpsons Arcade was developed and published by Konami, releasing in March 1991. By 1991, Konami was a well-established developer, releasing games throughout the 80s, including classic titles like Castlevania and Contra. But they weren't just releasing games for home consoles, but releasing a lot of games in the arcade. Konami were successful at establishing their own IP, but did work on licensed games from time to time, including a Top Gun game for the NES. In 1989, they released Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, a classic multiplayer beat-em-up for arcade, which ended up being their highest grossing arcade machine they ever made. While that game did get a sequel in 1991 with Turtles in Time, the fact that the first one did so well, you can see why they might want to expand out into other franchises with this formula. That eventually led to X-Men in 1992, but before that release, they released The Simpsons. So The Simpsons was ported to PS3 and Xbox 360 in February 2012 by Backbone Entertainment, who released a number of retro ports on the 360, mostly for Sega. Strangely, it was removed from PSN as soon as December 2013, and was removed from the Xbox Live Marketplace sometime after that. There doesn't seem to be an official reason why it was only available for a short time, but luckily for me I did purchase the game when it first released, and my Xbox 360 arcade I bought in 2008 still somehow works, so I'll be playing that version for this video. When booting the game it starts off with an attract mode that recreates the opening of the show, with character bios of each of the main members of The Simpsons thrown in. It's a pixel version of it, and isn't fully animated, but I still find it so charming. Video games based on licenses always try to recreate things like this, and it's always interesting to see what they can come up with with such blatant limitations, especially early games in the 90s. This one is pretty good. Having a version of the main theme playing over the top helps a lot, but that doesn't stop some of the characters looking off and kinda creepy. I get a bit creeped out with the way Homer's pupils move with that big grin on his face, and there's something so off about the giant void that is Bart's mouth. I also like that this is based on the season 1 version of the opening, with its darker blue sky and the man in the background eating a sandwich behind Homer. The game started development on the 26th of February 1990, releasing just a year after that in the US. What that means is that development started the same week as the Telltale Head episode aired, the 8th episode of season 1. By the time season 2 of the show had started, this game was pretty much done, which means that this game as a whole is very much based on that first season. 
The game itself starts with a short cutscene showing the Simpsons walking down the street when Smithers bursts out of a shop with a stolen diamond. He bumps into the Simpsons which cause the diamond to go flying into the air and land in Maggie's mouth. So Smithers rationally decides to steal her and run off. The rest of the game is then chasing down Smithers trying to get Maggie back. This is a very pure arcade style beat em up. The arcade machine had a joystick and two buttons, which means you can move in eight directions, you have an attack button and you have a jump button. You have one attack when you're on the ground and you have another one if you attack while jumping. There's also a hop attack you can do if you press jump and attack at the same time, but I had a difficult time using it consistently. It only seems to work about half the time and I could never figure out why, it just feels a bit random, so I actually didn't end up using it all that much. Anyway, the first stage is Downtown Springfield. I always liked the first level of Simpsons games, where the setting is a bit more of a basic recreation of the show before they have to ramp things up and get more sane in the later levels. It gives a bit more of a day in the life feel of the Simpsons, which feels closer to the show. With this being a game based on season one, there's references, but they didn't really have much to reference. As an example, nowadays there's tons of shops you could use from the show, but for this level the main one is Noise and Arcade, and they even ended up using the pet shop from the original season one opening. The enemies are also not from the show, you're just fighting random dudes who I believe are original characters for this game. Add to that things like Principal Skinner is here and just wearing a brown jacket rather than his iconic blue suit, and it gives this game almost a bootleg vibe, but I mean that in the best way possible. It still has the feeling of the show, but the developers had to create original assets in order to capture that because they didn't have enough to go on, and it's cool how they were able to achieve that feeling with so little. Speaking of bootleg, there's a boss at the end of every stage, with the first one being a large wrestler. Don't expect any of these bosses to make sense. The goal here is to chase Smithers down, but they throw whatever characters they can regardless of whether it makes sense or not. I didn't use much strategy for beating this boss. It appears if you want to do it properly, you have to dodge his attacks, wait for his trousers to fall down, and then go in for the kill. But as it's just the first stage and the first boss, I just attacked him. After enough hits, he goes down, Homer does his very weird looking dance, and we go back to chasing Smithers as he gets away in a crusty balloon. This is when you reach the first bonus stage, which has you mash buttons as fast as you can to try and blow up your balloon against a load of random AIs. The balloon being the head of the character that you're playing as, which you're going to use to chase after Smithers. It's creepy, but at least it's not as creepy as the Bart Simpsons Macy's Day Parade balloon. I don't know how a giant version of this flying through the air did not give kids nightmares. So after blowing up your balloon, you take that to the next stage, Krusty Land. Even in the first stage, this game did have a bit of a strange vibe, but Krusty Land is where it really starts to commit to this strangeness. It starts off with you fighting Krusty the Clown, only it's not him, but a guy dressed as him. There's a creepy Kearney looking baby in the background, which is horrible. You fight middle-aged men in spinning teacups. There's a large pink gorilla that looks like Homer that can punch you, and eventually you end up fighting a load of large white bunnies. The bunnies are references to Matt Groening's comic, Life is Hell, Actually, while we're here, we might as well start a Life is Hell reference counter. I have a feeling we're going to be seeing these rabbits a lot as we rank these games. All this weirdness builds up to the boss of the stage, a giant crusty ball with arms. With this being an arcade game, you just kind of roll with a lot of this weirdness, but don't worry, it's going to get stranger. After defeating the crusty ball, it smashes into the ground, causing you and Smithers to fall into a cemetery for some reason. You're straight back to beating people up, only this time you're fighting a lot of zombies. Zombies do have different moves, they try and leap over you, but it doesn't really change the way you fight them. You go up to them and you mash buttons. Each stage does introduce a new enemy type, but really most of the gameplay just comes down to mashing buttons. I was playing in free play mode that's available as part of the 360 port, which means I had unlimited lives and continues, and the gameplay resulted in mashing buttons, eventually die, respawn, mash more buttons, repeat. I wouldn't say it's a bad time playing this, there's enough charm to the game to carry you through it, but this is an arcade beat em up through and through. It's simple enough for anyone to play and have a go, but it's designed for you to put a lot of quarters into it in order to actually beat it. I didn't grow up with many beat em ups. Streets of Rage 2 is the main one I played on the Mega Drive when I was younger, so the nostalgia for this genre really isn't there for me. Doesn't mean I dislike them, but they can sometimes feel too mindless to play when going back and checking them out. Fighting a lot of enemies can be cool though, and the game moves at a fast pace which is good, but that loop of mashing, respawn, mashing, respawn can get a bit tiring. It doesn't help that this game suffers from the same problem as a lot of beat em ups, and that's you go and attack an enemy, but just miss because you weren't quite on the same plane as them. 
It's not a deal breaker, but this sort of thing can break the flow of gameplay. And when you're just trying to hit a certain enemy and you're missing when you're a little bit off, it's not great. Anyway, you get to the end of the cemetery only to find Krusty's grave for some reason. Actually, with his pacemaker and lifestyle, maybe it's not that shocking that this happened. A load of ghosts in chains then show up, forcing you to jump into it. This sends you down into a metal elevator shaft, and after reaching the bottom you find the entrance to Moe's, for some reason. The bosses come out of Moe's and you have to fight two goons, who look like children wearing their father's suits, while their face still look like their old men. While trying not to think about that too much, you defeat them both and enter stage 4, Moe's Tavern. Most having a seen a pretty nice upgrade. The whole stage takes place in the bar, meaning it's much, much longer than normal. You get to fight on the bar with Mo behind it, sometimes on the phone, sometimes doing drinks, and you even get to see Barney as well, both of them sporting their season one colors, which is really nice. I appreciate the effort here to get characters from the show into these levels. A lot of times they just stand there doing nothing, at best giving you a weapon or maybe a healing item, but it's so nice to see them here. Something that does help up the gameplay are these weapons. Whenever you see one on the ground, you can pick it up and give it a go. Sometimes this might be a one-time item like a rock, but other times it'll be a weapon you can use multiple times like a hammer. These were pretty cool to try out, apart from the slingshot. With the slingshot, it took a load of time just to even line up your shots to make sure you're even on the same plane as enemies, meaning it felt easier just to go up and punch them instead. So you get to the end of Moe's, you find what I assume is an original character, but it looks like a lanky, drugged out version of Kearney? What's up with all these Kearney references? Why was he the main character that they based original characters off? It's so odd. Beating him reveals a secret lift that takes you up into the Springfields Highlands, where a bear chased Smithers away, causing him to throw Maggie into a river and run off. This whole stage is based off Call of the Simpsons, the episode where Homer buys an RV and they all get lost in the wilderness, which is a terrible episode if you ask me. It's a decent stage. I like the big foots. Big feet? Big foots? Big feet? Big foots. Yeah. I like the big foots that have the same moves as Homer. That's a nice touch. And you can also use Blinky the fish as a weapon. Wait, Blinky? I thought he first appeared in season two when Burns spat him out. Oh, never mind. There he is in the third episode, Homer's Odyssey. Neat. Back to the game, I complained a bit about the gameplay before, largely with it being a basic beat-em-up rooted in its arcade design, but people enjoy this game overall, right, so why is that? Well, in part, it's likely due to the multiplayer. When you start the game, you get to pick between four different characters, Homer, Bart, Lisa, and Marge. They all largely control the same, although they do technically have different attacks. Like, while Homer may attack with his fists, Marge attacks with a hoover, Bart with a skateboard, and Lisa with a skipping rope. It's pretty fun messing around with the different characters and using their moves, but the best part about this is that you can play four player co-op with each person playing as a different member of the Simpsons family. That in itself is a great hook, and it's impressive that the first Simpsons game ever made allows you to properly play as the four main characters. The more basic gameplay makes more sense in this situation, when you have four players frantically attacking all the different enemies on screen. You also get combo moves, where two characters can link up and do an attack across the screen that knocks out multiple enemies, with different moves coming out depending on the two characters working together. You activate these by standing next to another player for a second, which means you can activate it accidentally, and there's also no real cooldown on them, so you can just do them over and over and over again if you want. Normally I would complain about this as it seems a bit broken, but it's all part of the chaos that is multiplayer. The cutscenes in the game also change depending on what character you play as. It only shows the character you and your friends are using, which is a really cool detail. Sadly for me, I mostly played this by myself for this video, but I did play this multiplayer when the 360 port first came out, as you could play online, and it was definitely really fun. Multiplayer is the way to play this game, but unfortunately that's easier said than done, considering it's difficult to even find a legal way to play this game nowadays. So you get to the end of Springfield Highlands and fight a bear. It felt a bit weird fighting and punching a bear, but don't worry, it's not animal cruelty, because once you beat him, it's revealed that it's a random goon in a costume. Hard to say whether he was hired to dress up as a bear and ambush the Simpsons, or if this is just a random man who lives in a cave and likes to roleplay as a bear. Moving on from this strange man, you fall down a cliff while trying to get Maggie Bag and land on your head, causing you to be knocked out and enter stage 6, Dreamland. Although season 1 has a lot of dream sequences, this one goes for a more standard dream setting, where it's actually closer to a cartoon version of heaven than a proper dream. I say standard, but we still have hostile versions of things related to each of the main characters, like donuts and flying saxophones. 
I guess they didn't have anything for Marge though, so instead they just have Marge heads Marge. popping out of the ground and attacking you. You get to the end of the stage and the boss is a giant bowling ball, which seems odd at first, but seeming how a bowling ball was the cause of Homer's and Marge's fight in life in the fast lane, almost causing Marge to have an affair, it kind of fits. So far the enemies have been okay to deal with in that mindless fun kind of way, but this is the first enemy in the game that wasn't really that fun to fight. As we are approaching the end of the game, the enemies and the bosses start to become bigger damage sponges, and that starts with this boss. The bowling ball has multiple phases with different attacks, but these are really hard to dodge, and each phase just takes way too many hits to complete. It feels a bit too drawn out to be fun. Still, this level and boss is quite bizarre, so on a first playthrough, this is unlikely to really bother you. You beat the bowling ball and get to the second and final bonus stage, where once again you're mashing buttons, but this time to wake up your characters. Once that's done, that takes us to the last proper stage, Channel 6. As mentioned before, the devs didn't have much to go off in terms of the source material, so they picked locations where it would make sense to have these locations, but it still allowed them to mix things up. Hence why we were just in Dreamland, and Channel 6 is largely here as an excuse to have a Japanese ninja themed section. At the beginning you walk past a TV presenter, but that isn't Kent Brockman, and is instead just a more generic guy? Kent Brockman did appear in Season 1 in Krusty Gets Busted, the episode that also gave us the proper design for Sideshow Bob, and Sideshow Bob does appear in this game, so Kent did exist at the time, but I'm guessing the developers didn't see him as an important enough character yet. Rewatching Season 1, there's actually quite a few news anchors in it, so it feels like maybe Kent just wasn't established as the main one, like he would be in the future seasons. This may sound odd considering all the different levels we've seen in such a short time, but another problem with the game is the level design and variety. The formula for beat em ups is go left to right and beat people up. That's largely it, which means the great ones make an effort to keep it interesting and are able to mix things up throughout the game. In Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles in Time, you have the surfing levels, which gameplay wise really help break things up. The Simpsons doesn't really have that. There's the bonus stages, I guess, and there's slight variety in the stages themselves, with some of them having a higher part of the level you can walk along, but there isn't really enough here to help keep things interesting. When you're going through the levels for the first time, just mashing buttons with friends, this doesn't matter too much, but when you're comparing it to other beat em ups, this one just doesn't do enough to stand out on the gameplay front in my opinion. Saying that, some stages do have mini bosses which help break this up, but the one in the TV station is the absolute worst. It's a robot that attacks you with his lasers and arms, and you get this space mutant here that you can throw at him a few times for extra damage. This boss has the same problem as the bowling ball, where it just takes too long, and the arm attack he does doesn't even look like a real attack, meaning it's a lot of mashing, being knocked back, mashing again. I'm not saying this is the optimal way of fighting this boss, or even playing this game in general. A quick YouTube search shows people who are insanely good at this game, but this is an arcade beat em up, so mashing buttons is going to be the average experience for most players. You get to the end of the stage, and it's a fight against a samurai who is oddly passive and easy, and then we're off to the final stage, the nuclear power plant. This stage is just the final two boss fights, starting with the man we've been chasing the whole time, Wayland Smithers. This game does feature the official voice cast for the Simpsons family, which is really cool, but they didn't get Harry Shearer in to do the voices of Smithers or Mr. Burns, and whoever did them instead I don't think ever watched the show. Welcome to my world. The Smithers fight isn't bad. He's got a coat full of bombs that he throws at you, but he also drops some bombs on the ground that you can pick up and throw back at him. Rather than taking place on one screen, it actually scrolls left to right, which means Smithers can go off screen, which doesn't feel too great. After beating him, he blows himself up, with Mr. Burns shortly smashing through the wall in a giant robot suit. This fight is also a bit of a slog, sadly, as it takes so many hits to defeat him, but it does have good final boss vibes, with the robot suit he's in changing forms as it takes damage. It definitely feels like a quarter guzzler though, one last attempt to get you to spend all your money just so you can see the end of the game. After delivering enough hits, the suit is destroyed, a 7 foot Mr. Burns pops out, and I, I'm pretty sure he dies. I mean that's a bit grim, but never mind that though, Maggie is rescued and the Simpsons walk down the street at night while the credits play. I've complained a decent amount about this game so far, but I really did have a good time in the end. It only took me 40 minutes to beat it on my first playthrough, and the short length really helps the flaws take a back seat. It's fun going through each level and experiencing all the weirdness, it's fun seeing all the early Simpsons references, and for the most part it's a decent time mashing your way through all the enemies. The presentation massively helps this game, 
It's so bright and colourful to look at, and I love the way it takes the Simpsons Seasons 1 art style and translates it into an arcade game. I won't lie, there's something so cute about the way Homer looks here. You know how you can pause the show and see some really bizarre faces, some of which at this point has become memes? Well, you can almost do that with this game as well. The animation for these characters are so expressive and exaggerated that you can see some really great poses by pausing. I love the ones for Marge, she looks so manic and crazy compared to her normal self in the show. Also, when she gets shocked, it shows her having ears, meaning I guess she's a rabbit person? Uh, not one I want to think about too much. The 360 port also includes the Japanese version of the game. The original Japanese release was 5 months after the US one, so it doesn't include any major content changes, just a few quality of life updates and tweaks, like a new score system and a couple new weapons like the atomic bomb. I think some of the bosses also got brand new attacks, which was very odd to see after playing the US one so many times. It probably is the better version due to these tweaks, but it doesn't matter too much which one you play, with the core game being the same in both. Before I move on to ranking this, there's a couple of ports of the game we need to take a look at. A company called Novo Trade ported the game to MS-DOS and the Commodore 64 in the same year it released in the arcades. Let's start with the MS-DOS port, and while it isn't able to achieve the same quality level as the original, the core game is still there on face value. It doesn't look as good, sure, but it manages to keep the same art style, and you get a faithful version of the intro cutscene, although some of the scenes are flipped for whatever reason. When I first started playing this, I thought it was alright, but its problems become clear very quickly. You can't quickly go between moving and attacking in the same way you can in the original, which means you're either moving or you're just standing still to attack. You don't move around during fights as much because of this, as it opens you up to being attacked as it's just much slower. On top of that, the enemies themselves move much quicker, and for whatever reason when you attack them, they don't get stunned properly and start moving again microseconds after you've hit them. This results in the game being a lot of just standing there, attacking over and over and hoping for the best. Yes, you can go and chase down enemies, but it's so slow and tedious to do so, and your attacks just don't connect in the way they should. I ended up getting a game over halfway through stage 2, and I was really happy to no longer have to play this because this was just a bad time. I would complain about it only supporting two players rather than the full four, but that doesn't really seem to matter, because this is a beat-em-up where the act of beating people up feels bad and it's frustrating. There's really not much to save this one, apart from maybe this sprite of Millhouse without his glasses on. Now, the Commodore 64 is a different story. I don't know much about the Commodore 64, but I know it definitely isn't as powerful as an arcade machine or a PC, so we are guaranteed to get something noticeably downgraded. You start the game and after a long loading screen you get a recreation of the opening from the main game, which honestly doesn't look too bad. It's clearly taken a hit, yes, but I expect it much worse honestly. I think the main reason for that is these black outlines, it really helps the visuals a lot. The character select screen is pretty close as well, although for some reason all the characters are blacked out initially and you just have these eyes staring at you from the void. After again, a pretty decent recreation of the opening cutscene showing Smith is stealing Maggie, we can start the game and it's a pretty rough first impression. A lot of the original art style has been lost due to the process of downgrading these graphics for 8-bit. While it is a clear downgrade, it does oddly feel impressive. You can tell a lot of effort went into trying to recreate the original and I was definitely expecting bigger cutbacks, but I was surprised at how much just remained here. There are even original enemies for this port like these flamethrower guys in stage 3. Fighting them really sucks, but still the effort is clearly there. Saying that though, it's still quite ugly and certain sprites just don't look right at all. Like just look at what they did to poor Marge, it's not even close. Marge. And if you don't mind not sleeping tonight, take a look at poor Otto in level 2. It's giving me flashbacks to the witch from Granny's Garden. Ultimately, while I'm impressed of how much of the original is here, the port is let down by how it plays. You can attack enemies, jump, and do the jump attack as before, but as this is the Commodore 64, it only had one button, which means you press the button to attack and have to hold the button to jump, which took me far too long to figure out. Having to hold the button to jump means it takes longer to jump and also do a jump attack, meaning I found myself defaulting to attacking normally rather than messing around trying to get the jump to work. It doesn't help that enemies can interrupt your jump quite easily as well, making it riskier to do. 
Like the MS-DOS port, the transition between attacking and moving is very slow, reducing the gameplay down to just going up to enemies and punching them, which takes a basic game and makes it even more basic and slow. Unlike the MS-DOS version though, you can actually hit enemies, and they don't move all over the screen, so while yes this is slow and stiff, you can actually beat enemies and progress. The Commodore 64 port also reduces the number of players down from 4 to 2, which is a shame, but is expected. I mean, just look at this, I can't say I'm surprised this doesn't support 4 players. You get the option when you boot up the game to enable unlimited lives, which I did, so I did beat the game and can confirm it's all here. My finger got pretty tired mashing the same button over and over again, especially in the last few stages when enemies are more spongy, but every stage is here. It was totally worth beating though, just to see this not quite right image of Bartman, and hear this insane music that plays when entering your high score. I didn't necessarily hate my time playing the Commodore 64 port, which is surprising, as my expectations were pretty low, and just seeing this game running has a real novelty to it. Although saying that, it's still hard to recommend, unless you're curious, or just have a lot of nostalgia for this version. Right, so for ranking every single Simpsons game, I'll be ranking each of them based on two main criteria. The first, is it a good game? And the second, is how much would a Simpsons fan get out of it? Is it a good game is exactly what it sounds like. Is it fun? Has it aged well? And as a video game, how good or bad is it? The second is more about its worth to a Simpsons fan. If you love The Simpsons and never played it before, will you find something interesting about the game and its interpretation of the franchise, or just find the fan service enjoyable? This means that this ranking will be more for Simpsons fans like myself, rather than solely about the quality of each game. So, The Simpsons for Arcade. Is it a good game? For the most part, I would say yes. It's very easy to pick up and play, and it's easy to enjoy especially if you can find other people to play with. The presentation really lifts the game up, and its short length benefits it, allowing you to have fun for an hour or so without it outstaying its welcome. Outside of that unfortunately, I do think it falls short in a few areas. It has the usual trappings of beat-em-ups of the time, with repetitive gameplay and quite a frustrating core loop, and when compared to the best of the genre, the variety just isn't there. Now that doesn't make it bad, it's still pretty good, but as a game, you're probably better off playing something like Turtles in Time or Streets of Rage. On to the second point, for a Simpsons fan, this is absolutely worth playing. I love the graphics, and it captures the show in a unique way that I don't think you'll find anywhere else. A very video game version of Season 1. It's cool seeing all the Season 1 references. I didn't even mention things like Howard poking his head out of the arcade in Level 1, which is a reference I didn't even catch on my first playthrough. Overall, I do think this is a good game, but I think the fact that it's difficult to find and play legally means people think a bit more fondly of it, and it's been given an almost cult status because of its scarcity. Having it available in arcades at launch, only to have it disappear and then come back 20 years later, just for it to disappear in less than 2 years again, is a real shame. If you do want to play it, Arcade 1UP did a re-release back in 2021 for arcade, so if you're lucky enough to live near an arcade which has it, it's definitely worth checking out. As this is the first game we're looking at for this list, it of course goes at number 1. I don't see it staying at that spot, but I think it should stay relatively high on the list. Finally, as the MS-DOS and the Commodore 64 versions were so different compared to the arcade original and 360 port, I'm going to rank those separately. For this list, if a game is different enough either in terms of design or quality, I'm going to separate it out, so this can be a more definitive ranking. Each version of these games is an official Simpsons release, so it feels only fair to rank them separately, for better or for worse. The MS-DOS version is just a bad game. They broke the core gameplay of beating up bad guys with awkward movement and attacking, and the enemies are way too fast, and it makes it all just so horrible to play. For a Simpsons fan, it's still largely the same as the original game, it just looks worse and plays worse, so I don't think there's much here to really check out and enjoy that you wouldn't just get from the arcade original. So, is the Commodore 64 port a good game? Sadly I have to say no for that as well. It's very sluggish and slow, the loading times are long, and a lot of the charm of the arcade original is lost. It's still oddly impressive as a port for the Commodore 64, and you can work your way through it, but ultimately it's just not all that fun to play nowadays. As a Simpsons fan, I almost would recommend it as well, just to see the weird 8-bit versions of the characters, as some of these are truly special. This means I'm ranking the Commodore 64 version in second under the original, and putting the MS-DOS version in third place. 
There's simply more value to the Commodore 64 port compared to the MS-DOS one, and really, it's the one I would prefer to play, despite it on paper being technically much, much worse. So that's the first three games put on the list. Thank you very much for watching. If you disagree with any of this, please let me know in the comments, and join me next time where I'll be ranking Bart first of the Space Mutants. That came out on more platforms than I'm willing to list out here.